hopefully we're all familiar with the story of the golden calf in the book of Exodus, uh, which we hear in our readings on this uh, fourth Thursday, Thursday of the fourth week of Lent. And of course it's the story after God has led his people out of Egypt, led them to Mount Sinai, and has given them the Ten Commandments, they immediately turn away from God's law and create the golden calf which they worship as God. It's an important thing to note that they don't worship necessarily a false god or a pagan god, but having come from Egypt in which they have different images and idols that personify or illustrate the gods, and no doubt as they go forth as a people they'll see other pagan faiths that have their images of their gods and goddesses, their pantheon of gods and goddesses, it would make sense that they would fall into that trap themselves. But God has forbidden that any graven image be made unto him. So this isn't exactly a false god, but they're saying this is the god that led us out of Egypt. And the violation is, of course, making God according to our own understanding of what God either is or what we think God is. The image of God, moving that God from place to place, moving that physical idol from place to place and worshiping it wherever it is and sacrificing to it as the God. It's a kind of control over the divine, but also a kind of presumptive uh, forming of the God according to our own imagination, our own craftsmanship, uh, and our own understanding of what God either is or what God should be. And that was their violation. They weren't worshiping a, God, a false God outright, but they were now painting and limiting and molding God into an image that they came to understand rather than the God that was being revealed to them through Moses and, and, and God's law. Can we relate to that today? Well, there's the endless debate over whether icons, holy images, statues, stained glass windows constitute making unto God a graven image. Um, and that has been a debate in the past and will no doubt be a debate in the future. But a thing to note is these aren't necessarily images that people worship outright. We don't move them from place to place and the worship of the God is takes place where those images or statues are. But rather they're images and, that lift our spirits and our minds to the ultimate worship of God or the example of the saints, the example of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the stories in the Bible, but ultimately leading us to the worship of God who is above all things. Uh, we don't worship them as gods themselves. Given that, we do perhaps today have a tendency to enter into not a kind of paganism, but a kind of golden calfism in which we make unto God a graven image, maybe not a physical image such as an idol like a golden calf, but we still engage in the kind of practices that led to the Israelites making that golden calf as an image of God. Let me give you an example. Uh, not too long ago, I was watching on one of the evening cable news talk shows, uh, two religious leaders who were debating and discussing uh, morality and its place in society. One was more traditional, the other was a little more progressive in his morality. And they were going back and forth and, and getting a little more smug with each other. And at one point, one of them said to the other, well, that may be the way it is with your God, but that's not how it is with my God. You may believe in a God that does this, but my God isn't that way. And I found that very, very telling because they were making the distinctions in the classification, your God and my God the God you worship, and the God I worship. And that is how we fall into that golden calfism of today. We may not make a physical object that we worship as a God, but we can at times make God a little more palatable to us or a little more conducive to our way of thinking. Uh, there's an old proverb, God made man in his own image, and man being a gentleman returned the compliment. And we in turn make God into our image or an image that we can relate to more fully rather than the God that is revealed to us. And it's an important thing to note, an important thing to remember. There is no your God. There is no my God. There is only God. And where God made us in his image, we don't necessarily turn and make God into our image, something much more palatable to us that, that is more agreeable to us. That is the kind of golden calfism that we see in the Old Testament. And oftentimes you'll hear people, you'll hear people um, uh, speak in terms of, uh, well, I can't imagine God being angry with that, or I think God is this way, or I think God is that way. And it reduces God not to the God that's been revealed to us, but an imaginary friend that we make in an image and likeness that's palatable to us. And, uh, and it's a time during the season of Lent, especially these remaining days and weeks of Lent, to consider how we approach God. Do we make excuses away from conversion to God's way 
by simply saying, well, God accepts me as I am, or God made me as I am. Therefore, God will accept me no matter what I do. Uh, while it's true, God loves us. God is not, however, a father who spoils his children, as many would paint him to be today. That no matter what we do, God will always love us and always accept us. We can't be painting God into our image. We must remember that we were made in God's image. And in and being made in God's image, we must conform our lives so that we can live as people made in the image and likeness of God. Not recreate God into an image that is in more conformity with us and our own failure or inadequacies as people called to live the standards of his gospel. So let us pray in these remaining days and weeks of Lent that we be more attuned to that and recognize where perhaps maybe all of us to one degree or another paint God as an imaginary friend and his law as nothing more than wishful thinking. Let us pray that we'll grow in accepting God as he has been revealed to us in the scriptures, through the prophets, through Christ, as has been taught by the church. And recognize where we've often painted God in our own image and likeness to make it a little more palatable to areas of our life that we might not want to conform to the gospel that Christ has given us. We do not create God in our image and likeness, but we must live our lives in recognition of the fact that it is God who made us in his image and likeness, and that there is no your God there is no my God. There is only the God that has been revealed to us and to whom we must worship as he is, not as we would have him be.